tonight's event entitled Our Built Environment features experts in Indigenous public education, architectural history and theory, architecture, and sustainable heritage conservation. I want to thank our panelists for their generous flexibility and for taking part in this virtual conversation. I'd also like to say thanks in advance to all of those who helped behind the scenes, uh, led by Dr. Ann Bowker, um, and all those who have made this such a robust success under these challenging pandemic times. Now over to our moderator now, uh, Professor of Film Studies, Dr. Malini Guha. Thanks, Malini. Thank you, Pauline. So welcome everyone to our panel. This panel revolves around a single overarching question. What is the contribution of the built environment to a healthy city and conversely to the rise of an unhealthy city? On the basis of this single overarching question, a range of other questions that our panelists will address this evening come into view. How do Indigenous perspectives help us to understand um, how to see the city, including how safe it is, and how to engage with it through healthy activities like walking outdoors? What are the legacies of public health planning for cities, including urban water supply landscapes, parks, cemeteries, and hospitals? What is the role of the architect, of humanities training for architects, and of different forms of collaboration in making healthy decisions for cities? How do communi communities benefits from and contribute to the city's architecture in space and time? How can we help elevate public aspirations for the city? Our panelists will be addressing these questions from a transnational perspective. So some will be talking about Ottawa while others will be talking about different cities. Our panelists will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. After that, we will open up the panel for discussion uh, and your questions. So please leave your questions in the chat box and I will read them out to our panelists. I will now introduce our panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. Jamie Morse is Michif from Northern Alberta, growing up in Lac La Biche and the surrounding area. Currently, Jamie works as the educator at the National Gallery of Canada in Indigenous programs and outreach. As a visual artist and dance group manager, Jamie is also an active part of Michif cultural history through creative avenues. Similarly, she is a mother of four and an entrepreneur of the owner of Indigenous Walks, a walk and talk tour through downtown Ottawa, exploring social, political and cultural issues from an Indigenous perspective. Jamie currently acts as the VP for Ottawa Heritage Connections and as a board member for the Distress Centre of Ottawa Region and has been on more parent advisory councils than she can count. Professor Susan Ross is an architect licensed in Quebec who has practiced in Montreal and Berlin. She is a former senior conservation architect in the Canadian government and now associate professor at the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies at Carleton University with a cross appointment to the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism. Susan teaches about sustainable heritage conservation and the historic urban landscape and her published research includes urban water supply landscapes in Montreal, conservation of modern wood heritage in Vancouver and 1930s apartment buildings in Ottawa. Her current focus examines the relationship between heritage and waste uh, documented on the waste heritage research. Active in local, national, and international heritage organizations, Susan is co-chair of the National Roundtable on Heritage and Education and a member of the College of Fellows of the Association for Preservation Technology. Professor Peter Kaufman is a supervisor of Carleton's History and Theory of Architecture program and past president of the Society for the Study of Architecture in Canada. His main area of research is Canadian historical architecture, particularly in Atlantic Canada. His architectural commentary appears periodically in newspapers, on radio, and on television. And his architectural photography has illustrated many publications in addition to his own. 
Professor Gul Kale is an assistant professor of architectural history and theory at Carleton. She is trained as an architect and architectural historian. She has been awarded the prestigious Getty slash ACLS postdoctoral fellowship in art history in 2019, uh, sorry, 2018 to 2019, and was the Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture associate at Harvard University during the winter of 2019. Her specialties are architectural history and theory with a focus on the early modern Ottoman Empire and global intellectual histories and theories of design and of the built environment in the wider Mediterranean world. Her book like project is the first sustained and critical analysis of a book on architecture written by a scholar on Ottoman architecture and on the life of an Ottoman chief architect. So these are our amazing panelists. It is my absolute pleasure and privilege to be able to moderate this discussion. And now I will turn things over to our first speaker, Jamie Morse. And also unmute. Hi everyone, my name is Jamie Morris. Um, and today I wanted to take you through a few slides. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. And uh, let's see, the first one here is the logo. So hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm originally from Northern Alberta. So I uh, have been in Ottawa for nearly 21 years. And um, when I first came to Ottawa, it was just like an entirely new world for me. And it was uh, probably during my walks with one of my children, all of my kids, uh, where I wanted them to be able to see themselves represented in the world kind of around them. So um, we would walk and, and talk and I would try to find my own way uh, to identify with a territory that I wasn't originally from. Um, so it, it became like a personal interest to uh, start this company called Indigenous Walks. And our main um, motto i suppose is is it's a walk and talk tour through through downtown ottawa and we look at art um we look at landscape we look at monuments and we also look at architecture so uh in the course of that hour and a half walk um there's a lot to cover because we talk about different issues that come up with each of the stops um so how i'm 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 gonna share um, my idea of healthy cities with you is, is just through some of the work that Indigenous Walks has been doing. Um, this was one of our very first walks and it, it, there was so many people, it was great. It was a free walk um, and we had so many people out and it really established for me that there was an interest in Indigenous um, social, political, cultural issues, anything people wanted to know. And uh, that was a motivation for me to kind of keep going and explore different ways of uh, presenting information to people. So this is in 2015 and um, this is with the mayor. I got a, a small grant uh, from the city of Ottawa to help me um, do some startup with, with the tours. Um, and that allowed me to go into some communities and, and talk about it as well. So my idea of a healthy city is including community members, is participating in um, activities at locations of interest. For instance, here at City Hall, some of you might recognize this in Ottawa by the lost child. It's a, 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 it's a, it's a, a, a what do you call it, a, a sculpture a very big sculpture, land sculpture, um, about an experience of the artist who had come down um, from the north and studied down south for, for in residential schools. So um, here we have, uh, at, at, in this image, as uh, you might recognize, Simon Brockpay. Um, he has a, a really, um, he has, he's, he's, he's such a great resource uh, and I, I almost guarantee, I, I swear, uh, probably almost everyone on this uh, talk will have, you know, heard of him. And if not, you know, he has a lot of uh, knowledge to give and to share. 
And on the tour, uh, he's sharing birch bark biting by folding up little pieces of birch bark and biting them and then opening them up to a, a beautiful image. So that that's a whole teaching, you know, that we sometimes get from our spot talkers on tours. And um, we go, uh, so not only are we outside, we spend some time outside all year round, but we go inside too. And uh, my goal is to try to find uh, places to connect with. Um, so here's uh, uh, in the same building as the previous slide, but a, a different uh, tour guide. Uh, this is uh, Alanis King, Alanis King, sorry. And uh, she's um, showing the, you could say, the ingenuity, the architecture of the canoe and the birch bark that's um, used in transporting people, you know, uh, uh, earlier than cars and vehicles and, and rivers where our, our runways, uh, I mean, our, um, our travel transportation system. And, and so having that knowledge of what the city, you know, uh, what, what Indigenous people were using, uh, what is now Ottawa, the city fort and, and some of the um, activities that were taking place were, were really uh, a way to, to uh, deeply understand the world around. And so uh, on the tours, we will sometimes, we have different tours. Sometimes uh, we'll talk about plants, you know, things that are just uh, around us all the time and that we, we might not know very much about them, but from an indigenous perspective. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a the monument um, at, just outside of City Hall, and it's uh, one of the oldest monuments, um, I believe, in, in the city of Ottawa. And it was erected to commemorate two fallen soldiers from out west during the, um, what was called, you can't really see it, I tried to highlight it here, but it says Northwest Rebellion on the bottom. And so so definitely that's, that's, that's one, um, sorry that's one uh monument that that speaks to a story uh that was held dearly and collectively by um ottawans and canadians at the time i think uh otherwise you know there's a there's a there's a whole um monument to the soldiers without recognizing a uh, machif or a metis history uh, during the the time of the the Northwest resistance, so I think that's kind of um, what I would put forth to say is a little bit of um, part of what is unhealthy. I think um, when I certainly when I walked past uh, this monument and, and did some research on it, I certainly um, you know was curious about the terminology. So. When we see um, symbols, terminology, uh, for for me as an indigenous person, uh, what comes attached to it is is um, the history is is our history. So um, this is a monument that I like to talk about because uh, it's so powerful in its position across from Lord Elgin, who was um, uh, Governor General of Canada who signed off on residential schools. And so having the uh, um, in Aboriginal War Veterans Monument facing the Lord El Elgin Hotel, um, I feel like there's almost not enough conversation there. And uh, for someone who knows the history of, of Lord Elgin, residential schools, uh, soldiers, even warriors, um, I think, you know, th that space is really uh, bubbling and that's that being just being in that space you know is um uh a point of of contact that can elicit safety or not and i think that uh being able to turn specific places into safe spaces even with what is already there is also another important um part of what in what you know i see as as a healthy city um, seeing the architecture and the uh, works of Indigenous people is definitely up there on my list and my idea of safe cities. So um, I wanted to include this, which was uh, re, um, 
it was updated, I guess, um, a, a couple of years ago. And so I got to meet the artist who was just out here and, uh, you know, working on the pole and, and having that showing, showing that action is, is important um, to the, showing the process of building architecture too is, is really important. So um, I wanted to bring you to my home. So welcome to Lac La Biche. This is where I'm from. And there's 3,000 people uh, that are uh, living in the town, but it, it can swell up to a little bit more on Fridays during the farmer's market when everybody comes in and shares their goods. So, um, you know, it, it, as small as it was, it was fairly multicultural. But I, I bring this up because this is like, I, I had this proximity to the water. I had the, you know, um, um, there's a, uh, right across the, you know, there's all kinds of like, I lost a ring on that beach. You know, we all have our stories of specific space, places. Uh, so I want to show you the next slide, which is um, in conjunction with the last, because I, I wanted to show that um, bringing architecture into the city from an Indigenous perspective isn't, doesn't even have to be that hard. Uh, we created this space. Um, I also work as an educator at the National Gallery of Canada. and um, my, uh, I had went out to go see my dad in 2016 and totally forgot that I had invited him to Ottawa. So he calls me five days before and he says, hey, what, what was the date you wanted me to come to Ottawa, you know, for the opening of your show, Abadakwane? So um, I'm like, yeah, that's in five days. So he had saved his money for a whole year, that whole year. And he hopped on a plane and he came. And we had been working with Yor Nango, who is uh, in the center of this image in the white hat. And his uh, piece was called the Sami Architectural, um, the Sami Architectural, oh, I forgot what it was. It was an architectural building uh, that was kind of from an Indigenous perspective. Um, so Yor, 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 J-O-A-R, Yor, is in the center. Grace Rat is an elder from Barrier Lake. Um, and in the very back right behind Grace is um, my dad. So he ended up coming to Ottawa and just by chance, you know, meeting um, Yor and realizing that Yor could use my dad's skills, which I had no idea that he had, uh, but he builds all these um, flashing poles and beams and the process to building the actual architectural um, building inside the gallery was was so fulfilling and I mean that because we had community out who um, were flushing the hides uh, there was knowledge transfer that happened and this is a space not typically used and it turned into a wonderful urban uh, makers space so while we're in the process of dying wool and dyeing hides and and scraping hides and whatnot um uh, this is this is one uh this is one photo that i just absolutely love because you know having a dripping wet uh somewhat smelly hide inside the national gallery uh across from uh the sami architectural library the library was the missing word for the uh art piece that i was talking about and if you got to see it i i think you know that's that's wonderful because um, he talks about these messy spaces and uh, these messy spaces that are, uh, you know, that look like what we've seen in some of the previous, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of like pushed aside as not important, but this is where all of our, our knowledge is, is transferred and how to make these beams and how to flush this hide and how to, you know, even for this, uh, this is a, a flusher. And so, you know, using uh, animal parts and just knowing all of that. I never in my wildest dreams imagined that when I moved here 21 years ago, that my dad would be teaching a world-class Indigenous artist um, his skills on essentially what is his maker space that he brought with him from Northern Alberta. So I I definitely see that as a, as a safe places you know safe places where families and kids and there was uh, music that was sung and uh it, it's it's um here's a kind of like a, a 
uh, another view of it. And, it. and it was really hard for some uh, an institution like the National Gallery to see <laughs> this mess, you know, this messiness in front of their beautiful um, uh, gallery. But when I see it, I just I think of the 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 smoking uh, structure that my dad made. And I think of uh, the willow, you know, that we used to dye the the hides. Um, so I, I I know I think I'm, I might be past my time, so I'm just going to stop there. And on this uh, wonderful image of of a uh, bannock that we cooked on the stove outside of uh, the National Gallery, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. So Susan is our next speaker. Thanks, Malini. I, I had the order a, a bit different, so I was a bit confused. Um, okay, I'll just share my, share my screen. How's that? Okay, I'm assuming everybody can see the screen. So, um, Good evening, and thank you for the chance to participate in this important discussion. Um, it's quite something to follow Jamie, actually, um, coming from such different uh, perspectives on this. So the question posed to us, which you see on the screen, is both an obvious one to ask and a very complicated one to answer. And I'd like to spend the, my next few minutes addressing the urban legacies of public health architecture, alternate ways of thinking about the healthy built environment, and a couple of examples of transformation underway for new hospitals and old schools. My examples are largely Ottawa based, but inspired by living and working in Montreal and Berlin. Just have to get this going here. I think we're all aware of living in a unique historical moment defined by some as a crisis of public health. Crisis in urban development has often led to major changes that otherwise might not have happened. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, increasing concerns for public health led to what Martin Melosi has called the sanitary city. A growing belief in public health explains why today, for example, most people in Canada have relatively, and I say most, relatively inexpensive water, reflecting that citizens at a cost to government and therefore to taxpayers believed in systems that served most people, including those who could not pay. Historic water infrastructure is celebrated in the discourse of progress as part of increased sanitation, hygiene, and health. Here, however, is a good example of how crisis enabled change. While typhoid ep epidemics put pressure on the city to purify the river water, it was concerned by property owners about fire safety and insurance rates that helped secure funds for greater advances in the city's collective water infrastructure. Furthermore, today with recognition that the Kichisipi watershed defines the traditional territories of Algonquin peoples, we must surely question how this public system is managed going forward as part of processes that will begin to decolonize access to clean water. We can tell similar stories and ask similarly difficult questions about almost any type of infrastructure that is a legacy of the sanitary city. New ideas for healthcare continuously define new forms and approaches, and we are seeing how quickly this might need to happen in an epidemic. But in addition to adapting for ongoing use, we need to think about sensitive planning as an engagement with history. This can mean finding meaningful new uses for old hospital buildings, which can be well suited to new community uses. Histories of urban cemeteries are also closely related to stories of disease, but many large urban burial grounds were also conceived of as parks, as escapes from the city. Changing ideals of burial and diverse cultural traditions have increasingly been integrated in these older and essential sites of the urban ecosystem. Our ideas about public parks in the city have also changed, been arguably, arguably been democratized. Parks are now better understood, not just as beautiful breathing space, but also buffers between sometimes conflicting uses and users. Most older city parks occupy sites left unbuilt for an earlier reason. Here in Lower Town, this park is located on the site of four earlier cemeteries, eventually moved to be further out of the city. Also nearby were eight unique healthcare institutions 
including an isolation hospital for contagious diseases. Now only one hospital building remains converted to condominiums, but inhabitants from all around still benefit from this historic space. The ideals, pressures and pr approaches to health in the city have changed. Preserving traces allow us to understand models as we plan for changing needs. Building on this more historical perspective, I'd like to mention three principles that can guide us in making decisions that will help keep our approaches to the built environment healthy. First, to allow for transitions, to allow for downtime, to leave places in fallow, when uncertainty allows for new expression, especially by more local interests. Important transformations need time to plant the seeds and take root. Secondly, to use projects that involve the renewal of older sites, which are often heavy with difficult significance, to make place to cultivate new approaches to paradoxes we need to think about, such as how we engage with urban nature. And thirdly, another idea gaining strength in, uh, in thinking about the city is to give ourselves the chance to learn from what happens to places in decline, to make safe forms of decay or aging with grace that have a role to play in renewing life, but also learning us to cope with loss. So I'm gonna talk quite briefly about a couple of sites. Although they're not perfect examples of what they could, could be, they can help us to think about some issues that new approaches to health could inform. The first example is the new Ottawa Hospital, which will be built on the site of the former Sir John Carling building in Central Experimental Farm near Dow's Lake in Carling. These images from the architects use examples from Germany on the left to evoke a new type of interior exterior public space where a podium with a green roof will connect pavilions that will provide daylight and enclosure. However, as someone who worked for years to try and understand how to fix the building that this project replaced, I'm always very conscious of the extreme ending to that story, including a 10 second implosion, which had immediate impacts on the farm and adjacent areas and long-term impacts on the ground. When the former Agriculture Canada headquarters was demolished, no one was looking at this building with its narrow, well-lit floor plates as an ideal future hospital. Only a fragment of the public area of the building was temporarily salvaged, mothballed, mothballed while most of the site was covered over and went into fallow. Only after the potential of this site for a new hospital was determined, was it then recognized that there were would need to be over $12 million invested in site decontamination. This unhealthy underground filled with explosive residue is so far from the ideas of hospitals designed to make the best use of exterior and interior environments. I can't help also but wonder how holistic ideas of health looking at nutrition and food supply might have helped bridge objectives for hospital and farm. Strangely, despite the experimental farms model, it's only recently that the National Capital Commission is rethinking the city's green belt as farmlands needed to revitalize sustain for sustainable urban agriculture. Furthermore, models of community gardens as part of neighborhood revitalization also illustrate possible healthy connections to make. My second example continues with some of the same concerns but looks at um, a less well-known story, the transformation of the Ecole the former Ecole Cadieux site in, in Vanier. The 345 Saint-Denis project and adjacent Parc Nou involve a range of ideals that are part of the sustainable city. For one, reusing a community building for housing, building new housing infill to develop density, and transforming a schoolyard into a public park. This image also shows how the inhabitants of this northeast part of Vanier profit from a position between two relatively well-treated cemeteries. From the ground level, it's easier to read the impact of not, of not building a condo tower, that is to say the, the school building still fits in with the neighborhood, but also how much work was involved in the remediation of so many acres of asphalt and cement. In fact, this project is one of many that needed to happen, that still need to, as this map shows of the former dump sites asso associated with many um, former uses by the Dominion Bridge Steel Company, as well as the waste of larger institutional properties. The school is in the upper, former school site is up here in the corner there. 
But thinking more expansively about what's possible in a site like this, I can't help but think, given the historic school context, as well as Vanier's uh, edged wood conditions, or woodland conditions, that there were other ways of approaching um, the park. Increasingly, schools are discovering the possibility of using their open spaces and play yards as learning grounds that help develop sensitivity to the needs of all urban inhabitants down to the smallest bumblebee. And the nearby Vanier community maple bush, an important breather for the neighborhood, could have been a model and could still be of how to use green space in new ways. Planning for healthy cities has left critical legacies to challenge the weaker aspects I think we should start with small changes because these can be surprisingly radical. And just to, to sort of end with um, an example that's quite timely um, with everything that's going on around schools right now, you might be surprised to realize that one of the areas of experimentation in post-war schools was to provide direct access from every classroom to outdoor areas. And in this case, you can see on the left to shaded areas. These days, ideas like giving classrooms direct access to the outdoors would be as much about mental health as physical safety. We can also look more at the movement to create outdoor classroom models, such as this one built, in fact, within a Beechwood Cemetery as part of develop, redeveloping a wetland. It doesn't take a very large area to have a huge impact, such as letting go of a liminal space on the edge of a cemetery to be reclaimed by natural processes that tip the balance in favor of the other creatures with whom we share the city. Cities are full of issues and crises to address, especially as historic urban landscapes. They are also my inspiration. I feel luckier than ever that I've traveled so much and also have made my home and worked in three great cities. All of my ideas, about renewing access to water, dealing with complicated park cohabitation, figuring out how to share food health in public spaces, or even design friendly public toilets come from these broader experiences. So some new ideas that you can look at are just across the river, others we can hopefully look forward to exploring again soon. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Malini. And uh, also thank you to Anne Bowker for in, in organizing this and inviting us to be here. And of course, this is such a, a rich and complex and important topic. And our overarching question about how the built environment impacts the health of the city is huge and very complicated. And I'm going to focus on one little corner of it. And that is the way or at least some of the ways that our built environment has an effect on our sense of community. And I'm going to divide that into three different categories, what I'm calling community in space, what I'm calling community in time, and also what I'm calling civic aspiration. So I'll start with community in space, by which I mean people who are just thrown together in a city like Ottawa or, or in a neighborhood like Hindenburg, which is where I live. I think a community is at a very basic level, simply human beings interacting with one another. And as I was working out my, my thoughts for tonight, I actually started to think of community not as a noun, but as a verb, as something that happens rather than as a thing. And our buildings and what they look like, how they work with the people, how they work in combination with each other can create or prevent opportunities for that kind of human interaction for community. Here we're looking at the National Gallery of Canada and, and that for example is designed in the hope of encouraging community both inside and with the exterior space here. It's, it's hoped that people will be attracted to this space and it's hoped that the, the transparent glass membrane of the building itself will remove all psychological barriers to entry. Architectural form here really invites us to commune and judging from some of Jamie's images and comments, uh, it seems that sometimes the, the National Gallery really does get it right. I think you could see this, say the same for this building. This is the uh, Halifax Public Library in Nova Scotia. And like the National Gallery, it's meant to be inviting. It's meant to make you want to go in. It's meant, meant to make you want to consider the place your own. And certainly in the case of the Halif Halifax Library, it's really worked. This is a really successful gathering place and it's a focal point for downtown Halifax. 
But for architecture to foster community, it's not just a matter of designing iconic monuments like this. Here in Ottawa, I think one of our most successful gathering spaces is the Byward Market. And it's a neighborhood of attractive but, but modest buildings. They're small in scale, they don't inspire awe, but they invite people to interact with them and they invite people to interact with one another. And that's one of the important things that our built environment can do for our sense of community. There's been a lot of buzz lately about the so-called 15 minute neighborhood, which I think <clears throat> means neighborhoods in which a, a, a range of amenities and services are clustered close together, thereby reducing the need to, to drive across town over and over again on a daily basis. And Hintenberg, which I'm showing you here, is arguably one of the more successful examples of this principle in Ottawa. And this is an issue of architectural design as well, I think. There, there's room for the odd quote unquote iconic building. You can see the church in the background. But mostly I think it requires more modest spaces, spaces that encourage informal interactions and have a lot of functional flexibility. And I think it helps if they're buildings that people actually want to be in and want to be near and want to be walking through and around. And I think scale and material can have a, bimp, a big impact on, on that. I also want to talk about what I'm calling community across time, which I think is very important, although I'm sometimes dismayed at the way this kind of community is often dismissed dismissed in the name of progress or maybe of profit, but dismissed as somehow sentimental or unworthy. What I mean by community of time is that, <clears throat> well, of course, we're, we're creatures of community. I think that's generally agreed. We're lot, not lone animals, we live in groups. But I've come to think more and more that community is something that stretches through time as well as around us in space. I think we seek connection to those who came before us. And I think if we're denied that connection, we are diminished. And that's one of the reasons why old buildings, heritage buildings are, I think, important. And when old and new meaningly can, me, meaningfully connect, uh, as in this example at Coventry Cathedral in England, I think we nurture that sense of community. So we need to have some old buildings. And this is critically important as well. We need to have their stories, the buildings those stories tell, because with some good research, some good historical digging, such buildings can become great storytellers. Some of these stories are fairly obvious and fairly easily found. This, of course, is Notre Dame Basilica downtown, and I think few would question the importance of a building like this. And many of its stories are fairly well documented and easy to, easy to get at and easy to, to discover. But we only have to cross the street from Notre Dame Basilica, uh, that is St. Patrick Street, to find something else of, of terrific value that's much more easily look and I think much more fragile. This is a building known as the Rochon Residence. It was probably built in 1832, and it's named after one of its first occupants, Pierre Rochon, who was a wood carver who worked uh, right across the street at Notre Dame Basilica. This house is one of the last surviving examples of the very modest working class houses that used to fill Laura Town. And it's a, a vivid and visceral window into the life, into the world of a working family in pre-Confederation Ottawa. It's a tangible connection to them. It's, it's not a heroic place like, like Notre Dame Basilica or anything more monumental or iconic. But I think it is a place where we can, at an imaginative level, sort of cohabitate with this other community of ours, our community that stretches across time. Uh, I'll just note in passing that the Rochon residence is federally owned, which means it has absolutely no legal heritage protection at all. So, so I think we need old buildings and we need their stories, but not just the obvious buildings and not just the obvious stories. We need to seek stories outside the dominant narrative. And here's an example that really struck me personally a few years back. This is a, the Bank of Commerce on Spark Street. And as you can see, if you're familiar with architectural styles, it's classical, it's based on Greek and Roman models. And this is a bank building that speaks the architectural language of power, of permanence, of the continuity of Western civilization. 
And as an architectural historian, I can easily decode that language and tell that story. It's, it's second nature to me. But one day in the summer of 2014, I was really vividly alerted to the different stories this building tells when it's seen by different eyes. And this was the occasion. Here we have an indigenous dancer in, in front of this symbol of Western power, performing very poignantly a dance of healing. And this was a real epiphany for me personally, because it made me realize what a different story this building tells if you're looking at it from a different place. And we need to learn and we need to tell these stories too. And that is one of the things that's so wonderful, I think, about Jamie's work with Indigenous Walks, is it, is it uncovers these stories. It, it tells us these stories that we haven't been hearing before. And that's such a wonderful thing. I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's not a concession to be made. It's, it's a gift to be embraced. The last category I want to talk about is civic aspiration. And I can summarize it with a historical story, a story about um, this architect, Inigo Jones, who worked in England in the er first half of the 17th century. And the king had granted some land in the part of London known as Covent Garden to someone who was essentially what we would call a developer. And he was going to build a great neighborhood in this area called Covent Garden. But one of the conditions that was put on the developer by the king was that he had to hire Inigo Jones as an architect, and he had to build a church as part of this development. And the developer wasn't too keen on the additional expense, needless to say. And so the story goes, he told Inigo Jones to keep it really simple. And, and he said, I don't want a fancy church, make it more like a barn. And Jones is said to have replied after that instruction, very well, sir, then you shall have the handsomest barn in England. And the barn he built is still here. This is at St. Paul's Covent Garden, and it's still one of London's most beloved landmarks. And I love that story because it pits an ambitious, idealistic architect against a stingy client, and the architect wins. He builds something excellent. He builds something that is for the public good. And historically, we've seen that attitude win the day here in Ottawa as well, at least some of the time. This is the Fleet Street pumping station, which was Ottawa's first municipal water supply. It was built between 1874 and 75. And as you can see, it's made of stone. Again, it's classical in style. It's really quite beautifully detailed. What strikes me about this is that this building exudes a sense of dignity, not just architectural dignity, but dignity of purpose. It exudes a belief that public works were for the public good and that noble architectural expression, however each era defines that, is an integral part of that public good. And we can see that at the federal level as well with the Richardsonian Romanesque post offices built across the country in the 19th century. The two I show you here, the one on the left is in Carlton Place, the one on the right is in Almont. Naturally, this sense of aspiration, this conviction that great civic function requires great civic architecture has an enemy, and that enemy is cheapness, stinginess. And here's how one critic put it. This is a quote. Our architecture has the look of money's worth, of a stopping short wherever and whenever we can, of a lazy compliance with low conditions, never a fair putting forth of our strength. This isn't a new problem, of course. It's just what Inigo Jones was up against at Covent Garden. And although this quote seems like it could have been written today, it could have been written in Ottawa. In fact, it was written in 1849 by, by critic John Ruskin. So these competing forces, aspiration and cheapness, are always in a tug of war. Now, how does Ottawa do on this front? Well, we'd have to say the, the um, results are at best kind of mixed. Uh, there are a lot of examples I could cite. The, the, the one I've chosen may seem a little odd, the LRT. Uh, and it may seem odd because we don't necessarily think of the LRT as architecture, but of course, as well as a way of moving people, it's a really major feature of our built environment. And as I'm sure everyone here knows, it has been fraught with problems from the start, problems indicative of chronic corner cutting in design and construction, problems that tell us that the cheapest possible solution was always considered the best solution. And I think everyone agrees that this is not excellence. And yet, the design specs apparently met the minimum requirements. They must have ticked all the required boxes or else the consortium that built it wouldn't have gotten the job. 
And I think this raises a, a, a troubling question going forward. Have we replaced civic aspiration, which I think Ottawa at one time did show, with a culture of minimum requirements and box ticking? And are we aiming anywhere nearly high enough? And so on that pessimistic note, I will uh, pass it on to Melini and the next panelist. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Gul, go ahead. Yes. Share. Here we go. Okay. Uh, good evening. It is a gra uh, great to be in this panel with this fantastic uh, colleagues. And they, uh, they have already covered uh, many grants. So I will visit a few examples of how built environments relates to health or unhealthy city by looking at the case of Istanbul. So I will be taking you to some historical and contemporary examples to talk about this. I would like to first start by the word architect. So the word architect in Turkish is mimar. And I find it very telling because although its contemporary meaning is often associated with monumental buildings, big structures, landmarks, as everywhere else, its roots tell us something else. This word mimar comes from the root word imar, and it means to cultivate. And so this route immediately takes us to somewhere else than these monuments and landmarks that we are often uh, seeing around us. It links us to the land and it links us to the relation between nature and the built environment. Another word used in the past for the architect is also very telling. It meant joy giver. And its roots is also very interesting about how people saw the architect as someone giving joy to their surroundings. They looked at the holes created on earth in the past and associated these acts with joy giving, bringing prosperity to the land. So in this case, the importance of small interventions to make a healthy city and livable environment intersect with the duty of the architect, which takes us to those important roles that we often forget. So the architect in this case, by even making this holes in contact with nature, by preserving it, yet providing dwellings for people, mediates between nature and the built environment and the community. So the the prosperity of a city then relied not only on making these monumental structures, but the relationship between natural sources such as clean water, air, soil, and the architecture. And how did they find this balance? That will be my question. And I think while I'm going through some examples, we can also think similar things in relation to Ottawa, because those are questions that might relate to anywhere, any city, despite historical differences. The urban decision-making has always been complicated in the past as it is today. And it didn't happen, however, behind closed doors as we often think. There was always a public opinion and oppositions. So they couldn't, if the rulers wanted to do something, get away with it as much as they wanted. And we can only access this through some historical accounts which carry the gossip circulating in the cities, which is very interesting to read. But I will give some example to make us think about architects and the architects mediating role to establish this connection between history, nature, built environment and people. This intends to show that how we can go beyond our personal limits to see that each decision in our cities will be affecting us eventually. And pandemic made this relation, I think, very clear for us. So I will look at the case of Istanbul because 
it is a metropolis which doesn't necessarily have often the luxury of providing the natural environments for its population, unfortunately, in these difficult times, particularly. But we can learn some things by looking at examples. I want to use uh, mention another word that relates to decision making in the cities. And this word relates to the fact that the decisions mentioned often the word munasib, which meant appropriateness. And why is it important seeing such a word in historical records in decision making? Because this word has the root meaning of making proportionate balanced decisions. In one example that I will give you, we can see how these decisions were made. In the 16th century, Istanbul, Hagia Sophia, as you might all know, had houses bending at the time towards its walls. This was damage, damaging the building. And this building we have to remember as it is today was seen as a part of an ancient wisdom by the population in Istanbul. So when the architects were told to remove these checks, they were responsible to make it in an appropriate manner. What does it mean? It meant that while you are trying to protect this historical site and building, and it was an ancient building for them as well in the 16th century, they had to consider the community's needs for dwellings, healthy places where they can, they can live. So they had to be compensated while these decisions were taken. And that was what they meant by make an appropriate act, make it balanced so that the society will not suffer. And in another example, which is again very unique to Istanbul, the question of water comes often in the 16th century. At that time, Istanbul was suffering from the lack of water, but the decisions are also very telling how they made them. The architect didn't tear down green areas or open giant canals like they are projecting today, but they followed ancient ruins, traces, and they followed nature, nature occurrences such as the quality of soil to trace and bring water to fountains in the city. So again, the, one of the other questions was that in addition to following historical examples, historical ancient wisdom, and also treating nature, not as something you can just control or dominate, but as a part of your life, which you have to listen closely, they had other concerns such as, of course, finances, but this was also a matter that needed balance. It was needed that the public treasury had to be protected from unnecessary expenditure. So it wouldn't be kind of using the image of the ruler to promote the source of water, but that the public treasury had to be in a way very well calculated to, to provide the sources for these monumental structures. And additionally, this water coming to Istanbul had to be distributed equally. What does it mean? It means that there were complaints when someone took the water to bring it to their private houses. People would say that the water should reach everyone equally. And these were the discussions happening. And I put those examples in relation to similar projects that are going on. However, in a contrast to the decision making happening in the past, and despite the attempts often to appropriate history and use it, we have to also see the untold histories, the stories of people which are way more telling often about how nature built environment and the communities were coming together. This proposed new project in Istanbul, for example, tries to open a canal through this, uh, this land that has never been touched before in that manner. And the image you see in the middle 
suggest that by opening this canal that you see erases everything around, it will be creating healthy environments. So that's the kind of a question we have to ask, is this a healthy environment when you erase everything and kind of develop, just push for the developments in a city that tried to protect it for various reasons for centuries. And another example that uh, we can think of is about the historical famous hills of Istanbul. So the healthy city then is a place where you can breathe, but this is breathing both mentally and physically. Green areas have been the source of Istanbul's air for centuries. People see that trees are the source of air as everywhere else. And it, Istanbul has often been celebrated for its high points that bring the sea, air, sun together. They serve the ex excursion spots for people to enjoy. And people's health and mood relied on this balance between this natural settings and the built environment. Trees were protected for centuries for that reason. Open spaces and gardens were seen essential. So when we look at hilltops being filled with buildings and we see here the Chamlija Hill and later the new edition of the, uh, the, the imitation of the Sultan Ahmed Mosque we see here, it's more than a nostalgia that we kind of mourn the loss of. It is mourning the loss of the natural connection that the city has with its own land. And whereas even in the past, the building of such uh, mosques wasn't an e issue and the uh, people had to convince the public that it will not be harmful to the surroundings when the constructions were happening and that it wouldn't be spending the public money. Today, most decisions take place behind hidden doors and then you face with pieces of architecture that you have no idea where it came, it came from. Another case, again, relates to the attention to living places to breed for all levels of the society. Here we see the Taksim Square, a place that when I was an architecture school a student going to Tashkish, I passed by often. Today, when I visit, I really want to walk very fast and pass that area. The fillings of the Taksim Square with concrete cut the air both metaphorically and physically. And why I, feel, why I feel that way? Because I feel the air that allowed me and people to breathe was cut. And this area, which used to be active with many cultural, uh, cultural activities, green, green parks, and the various social uh, you know, uh, gatherings, now is a place that you don't want to even stand under the hot August sun. So both for a holistic view of the relation between community built environment, nature, history, we need collaborative efforts because all of the examples I showed are not the uh, result of an architect's the creative genius's work. It was a communal decision making and we read them in the histories. So why can't we do those decisions along with the architects, communities and the various uh, officials uh, coming together and discussing along with the kind of people working on this uh, histories and cities. The decisions must be all taken in this participatory environment. We shouldn't wake up to the news of neighborhood areas demolished and gentrified. I passed one image before. Here we see around the Taksim area. Uh, this is the Tarlabashi and it was consisting of the, again, partly historical houses, but also it was a setting for low income, um, uh, citizens and they were renting the houses there. Then it was recently demolished with an advertisement of a development promoting, of course, residences for 
specific groups we can afford it but we can witness the transformations we change the whole neighborhood again decisions which weren't discussed openly and clearly so i want to and uh, by noting the necessity of architects to develop this wider perspective to see built environment in relation to these issues that are we are facing in the cities and in all levels of the decision making that concerns not only making landmarks but in relation to providing infrastructure providing social gathering areas providing healthy environments and to see how each act reaches to individual houses. This is also one of my final uh, points because today in the pandemic, what we noticed the most is our longing for being outside and with our loved ones. We need open spaces, we notice this more and we need nature in our cities. Again, we notice this more. We see and feel how actually each major decision in the city comes and haunts us at home more than ever. And because those are the only places we can be now, the outside becomes our extension. It is not something we merely look at. It envelops us in the most phenomenological sense. So the demolished open green areas has now a direct impact on any individual because we have, we have nowhere to escape. And we are face to face with our city's built environment and its limits. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much everyone for these really, really wonderful and enriching talks. So much to dig into. Um, so now we have time for questions, quite a bit of time. Um, I think I'll kick it off and then and then I'll dig into the chat um, and, and read out some questions from there. Um, so I have a big question for, for our panelists. Um, and it's a question of, let, let's try to dig a bit more into this question of what is a healthy city? Um, from the perspective of the built environment. And as Susan was saying, you know, it seems like an obvious kind of question. Yes, the built environment must contribute to healthy cities. But as we have seen from all these talks, this is a very complicated question to answer. Um, and so what I think is so interesting about these talks is that the idea of healthy is, is really expansive. Um, it seems to involve so many things. Uh, it involves questions of engagement, um, you know, how a city space has become more inviting to its inhabitants or to its visitors, how it doesn't, um, as Gould was saying with the example of Gezi Park. Um, a healthy city involves questions of infrastructure, you know, stemming from healthcare infrastructures to, you know, Ottawa's kind of ongoing disaster <laughs> with the LRT seems to not end. Um, and also it involves kinds of aspirations for the city. Uh, and involving questions of cultivation, as Gul was telling us, but also how aspirations can give primacy to the things that matter, uh, accessibility, affordable housing, uh, to various forms of social justice, um, you know, opening up pathways to the, the city's history, histories that may not be so well known, um, and also like trying to community in the way Peter was saying, um, and, and, and thinking about the participatory public life of the city. So all of these different things uh, have made me think about the question of governance. So, you know, who ends up making these decisions about what is a healthy city? And then the question of who is left out of such decision-making processes. So I'm gonna build from this bit Bit of a long preamble, but I'm going to build from Gould's final question here and ask, uh, ask our panelists to think about the question of how we can imagine different kinds of structures of governance uh, that might be more conducive to addressing the complexities of making a healthy urban environment. So questions of collaboration that Gould was talking about 
Um, are there examples of, of this form of collaboration that is, has been fruitful between you know, architects, communities, activists, um, scholars, artists, officials? Uh, are, the, are there any forms of collaborative working that you can think of um, that have been effective or ones that you can imagine? Or conversely, should we be thinking more about what Susan Ross was talking about, uh, the idea of small but radical acts of intervention? And you know, I was thinking a lot about Jamie's talk uh, when this idea came to mind and thinking about the Sammy Architectural Library, which I had the pleasure of visiting a bunch of times. And I love the way Jamie was talking about this um, as, as something that was potentially disruptive to, to the, the smooth facade of the National Gallery, but also as a site of knowledge transfer that might appear small, but, but extremely radical. So yeah, that's this very large question that I'm throwing at our panelists. I'm happy, happy to, to jump in. Oh, go ahead, Jamie. Sure, I, I'll be really brief. I just wanted to say that um, even even though like that that was a very successful project, but I have to say that even though the spaces were there and the architecture were there, we had you know the burden of policies uh, and got and bylaws, and even to um, make a fire so that we can boil water, cook bannock was a big deal. It meant calling in the fire chief. And, you know, even that was an interesting interaction because we found out that Ottawa's fire chief is Mohawk. And he made a connection with our uh, curator who is also Mohawk. And so um, that was, you know, potentially there could have been, um, uh, there could have been a lot of issues with you know, just with just with having a fire, but I, but that was, you know, who knew <laughs> Ottawa's fire chief at the time, you know, was was a Mohawk. So, um, I wanted to also say that, um, yeah, I guess that's that's what else was I going to say? I'll leave it there until somebody else has another question. I have so much to say, but I want to hear other people too. Um. Should I go ahead, Melini? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yes, because you were asking about different models. And um, so I had the chance when I was living in Montreal, where I'm from, to, uh, to be part of a group um, called Les Amis de la Montagne, the Friends of the Mountain. And the mountain is Mount Royal. And um, I was hired, this was while I was a graduate student, to run a public forum, which was a monthly event to bring together the public to talk about issues on the mountain. And it was a statutory, it happened every month. And we came up with an agenda for the year of issues, whether it was, um, you know, bicycle lanes or uh, development of mausoleums in the cemeteries or the need for um, more accessible uh, paths or, you know, all, all kinds of things, uh, tree planting. There was, there was always a, a real diversity of different issues. And just establishing that there was always going to be a public meeting um, gave this kind of momentum to the feeling that the community was getting together to always talk about this. And this organization also was, of course, then meeting with the city and with different property owners and different large institutional owners and was taking what we learned from these meetings to, to represent this. Um, and eventually this organization actually became in some ways part of the city. And there's now an existing, not an existing, um, there's now a, uh, a group of organizations that are all, you know, much more powerful and related to Mount Royal who have to meet all the time to talk about everything. And so there was something, it was kind of something from the ground up that then actually became part of how things worked, but it was part of a time also in both in Quebec and in Montreal when consultation was really working well. I'm not sure that that's still the case. And it was, it was also just after working on that, that I moved to Ottawa and was just astonished that consultation, and you know, I hear everything Peter's been saying about how challenging this city is, was consultation here doesn't seem to actually be listened to. Um, and I think it has something to do with how it's done. Um, 
there's ways of doing it where it's led by the people instead of led by consultants who've been hired to do a checklist. So that's, that's my idea of an alternate uh, pattern, but it had, it took a long time. Thank you both. Uh, Peter, yeah, would you like to weigh in? I'll just, uh, <clears throat> I don't know the answer to your question, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, just based on a couple of, of brick walls I've run into dealing with this sort of issue and just partly riffing off what Susan just said as well, I think that there are two things in terms of government governance here that have consistently frustrated me. One is this thing of consultation. And I very quickly learned that there are two kinds of consultation. There's consultation you do because you want to generate better ideas. And there's consultation that you do because you want to be able to say, I consulted. And here we have way too much of the latter and not nearly enough of the former. And I've seen that again and again. The other change I would love to see is governance that values results at least as much as it values process. And, and that's something I find really lacking here. There seems to be this fetish for process and taking the boxes and, and highly placed elected officials saying, well, all the procedures were followed, so everything's fine, even when things are very obviously not fine. And, and that's something that I have found very frustrating on more than one occasion. I have a hunch I'm not the only one here who has. <laughs> I think we need both. <laughs> I think we need both process and results. <laughs> the process is also part of the politics, making it good. So oh, uh, yes, go yeah, maybe I can uh, give an example, not really related to Otto, but from my earlier examples while I was working as an architect in a project run by my professors at Istanbul Technical University. Uh, as students, we went to one of the old towns in uh, a city in Turkey, Buldan, and it was famous with historical houses, but they were all falling apart. And we as a group were, uh, as a project, responsible to do a survey of the houses. And one of the problems was that the challenge we faced was that the, the houses were under kind of protection. They were part of the heritage. However, people didn't have the sources to renovate them. So they are living in these houses, which has nothing, no sources, water, you know, they are, everything is falling apart and they are not, they are not, they can't do anything because they don't also have the financial sources to renovate them in the proper way. So here it was very clear that there, they needed a mediator. I think they want, they finally, I heard that um, they made one example house renovation to serve as a model. However, um, this a project really, we kind of surveyed and documented everything, but it couldn't come to an end because there was no collaboration between the users, the kind of the community, the heritage, you know, uh, responsible people for the her heritage protection and the governance that will create a common source to protect them. So that was, I think, an, uh, still an example for me to remember those um, difficulties and the need. Uh, would anyone else like to weigh in? I mean, I mean, the one thing that, um, and it's kind of hard for me to say it because it, 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 it's like so much more of an explanation that we have time for. But um, there's there's ways in which you know, in terms of governance and how um, you know things can can be managed. A lot of, and I don't fully understand it either, but a lot of our teachings go back to our governance as just being natural law. I saw somebody ask about, you know, what about COVID in the built environment? You know, so that that's, um, there are things that control, you know, us beyond, well, you know, beyond what we can ourselves. And so, um, I know, you know, certainly talking from my dad and his boss is the land and the territory and the environment and um, and there is a there is a there is a way of I know that we're talking about like, like people and governance and, and people and govern governance structures and stuff but 
Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to put that out there. I don't know all of the teachings around it, but that's like our, our boss, you know, so that's our, and we follow everything that they give to us. Mm. I think that's a fantastic intervention. Um, on the one hand, thinking about, you know, better methods of consultation and process and mediation, but on the other hand, questioning um, human agency in all of this anyway, uh, that there are, there are other, other, other elements at play when we talk about architecture and the built environment and what it means um, to be guided by, by land, by water, by, by the things that, that are already there predate us. Yeah, that's great. Um, let me take a look. We have, yeah, so there was the question about COVID in the built environment. Um, maybe I'll pose one more question before that. Um, so this question is for Susan or it's for any panelist um, who would like to share their architectural vision. Uh, for a healthier city and communities, do you believe that we will try to landscape more outdoor areas near schools or on school campuses? Do you believe that there is potential for having Carleton and other universities further develop outdoor classrooms, um, i.e. could affordable seasonal inviting outdoor classrooms be created along the Rideau River? Uh, how would you envision such architecture? So it's a question for anybody who would like to answer it. Uh, Susan, <laughs> would you like to? Sure, I'll, I'll start. I mean, definitely, I think that we're going to see new ideas around schools and, and universities too. And, you know, we know these are places where people talk about ideas. So things will be experimented with. Um, there's a number of um, universities that already see themselves as laboratories in terms of their campuses and what they're doing, right? Like UBC is famous for that, that they're trying all these different things with all their buildings all the time. Um, and I think schools are excellent places and there have been, there's actually just been this, strangely, just before COVID, there was this fantastic, um, it was called Lab École, this experiment in Quebec to try and rethink the school. Um, and and they're building, I think, six different pilot schools now to try to try out different things. And I'm sure all of this is going to be come part of what they're looking at. But just one one idea I want to throw out there in terms of the outdoor classroom is that it's my understanding that we have the school year set up the way we do because people used to need to have the summer to go to the farm and to be part of harvesting and, and working um, in the land. And so the school year was kind of set up with the idea that the time you're in the school is when you're less needed on the land. Maybe, maybe in fact, if we were wanting to rethink more radically about how to have more land and climate related appropriate teaching, we would have to rethink the seasons we teach in because of our climate. And, you know, maybe center more of a certain kind of outdoor learning. Um, land based pedagogy is going to probably bring some of that thinking into Carleton soon, I hope. Um, so yeah, it's initial responses. Oh, that's so interesting that you say that. Only because I've been thinking about that. Like what <laughs> if we could just move school to the summer <laughs> for a year uh, in co during this time, but that, that's so interesting. Um, would anyone else like to comment on that on that question? I can jump in with something. It's not an earth shattering observation or, or anything, but COVID has actually made me rethink in ways I'd never imagined or expected the, uh, the way I use a classroom. And so when things do go back to normal, whatever normal is, I, because I've been forced into it, I've discovered that I can, in a, in a lecture course anyway, I can deliver core course content without using a classroom. And, and I can do it reasonably effectively and the students are happy with it. And that's made me think, oh, well, once I'm back in the classroom, if I can deliver that material some other way, maybe I can use the classroom time for something else. And maybe it doesn't even have to be in the classroom. You know, maybe we can meet, I'm teaching a medieval 
architecture course right now. Maybe we could meet out in a snowy field with sticks and ropes and, and learn how to lay out uh, a medieval cathedral with sticks and ropes the way they did it in the 12th century, for example. You know, maybe we can meet at places downtown and so on. Maybe we can go to some manufacturing place. You know, it just made me think that this whole idea of classroom and classroom time has been completely blown up for me because of COVID in ways that, uh, you know, I would gladly have done out, done without the challenge of the last 11 months, as I think many of us would have. But that said, it has given me ideas that I would never have gotten otherwise. And a lot of them are about the classroom and what constitutes a classroom. And it's not necessarily a four-walled space inside a university campus. Maybe the field trip is back. <laughs> Maybe that's do more field trips. Uh, Jamie or Gould, do you have anything to you'd like to say? I mean, Jamie, I'm wondering because you also work um, in the education department at the National Gallery. Um, and so this question, I think, would also be relevant for you. I, missed, I have you have to repeat it first. <laughs> sure. I will repeat it. Um, Is it in the chat? Yeah, it's in the chat. Uh, I will repeat it, though. Uh, so for a healthy, healthier city and communities, do you believe that we will try to landscape more outdoor areas near schools or on school campuses? Uh, do you believe that there's potential for having Carleton and other universities develop outdoor classes um, and thinking about seasonal uh, outdoor classrooms? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I um, I did teach for a little while at Carleton and and uh, Algonquin College, um, and I graduated there. Looking at my degree signed by Mark Garneau at the time, and so um, uh, I had often thought about an entire course of walking tours, an Indigenous Studies course. You, there's no classroom. There's never going to be a classroom. It's every week, once a week, you show up for your walk and. Um, so that was one of my, um, you know, kind of ways of, uh, I thought would be interesting and, and important because you're, you're going out, you're experiencing different things with your classmates and creating a little community with what you have. Um, and so, yeah, definitely the whole, um, like right now my brain isn't, um, in the, the whole like land and indigenous people and building stuff. Like I have no answer for that right now, but like there's, there's, there's a, yeah, it's, it's very complicated. And I, in my little part of the world, you know, I bring awareness in that education component. And so having the spaces available to go to, um, and that means not just like some stuff that's already built, but um, things that are, are, are created by the land and you know the architecture of mother earth has her own you know places to go to so we will check out those things so anyway hmm. i love that the architecture of the earth is beautiful um and walking tours and yeah um i love I mean, the way COVID is making us rethink these things and in fact you know we, we do have a, a structure like a physical structure that represents like the womb of mother earth and um, th those are, I, I remember being 12 and going to those outside of school, outside of family events, outside of whatever. And, um, you know, that structure was available, but for so long they had to hide them and they kept going deeper and deeper into the bush kind of thing. And so, um, you know, th those were uh, huge teachings just in that structure itself of making the dome, the womb of mother earth that we all go into and, you know, go back to our infancy, <laughs> so. Beautiful, yeah. Uh, Gu, would you like to jump in? Uh, no, I think, um, you know, most uh, already has been said and I agree with uh, all my panelists, but I mean, for me, anything by the river is amazing. So this idea, but also the um, question of, for example, it occurred to me last term in the beginning, uh, also if we can go to the parks even with kind of a small group, but 
it also brought out all those bureaucratic limits, right? This kind of difficulties in decision making for us. And that makes me question not only the classroom, but to connect it to a few other examples related to health, talking about that. Because, um, you know, I have family and friends who are working in the in hospitals and uh, I remember often them talking about like a friend who is doing surgery in operation room and uh, she's mentioning how they ran out of the operation room to find a place to breathe right and then or you know you need to move the clinic uh, and the chronic uh, patients to the corridors I'm talking about different examples from Turkey and US but because they are all dedicated to COVID right and that and there's a whole kind of argument between clinics who occupies the corridor because there is no mediator to even take this like i'm sure there would be a few people who would bring some solutions to there but it because of this difficulties and limits it made me often think why some things get so difficult while we can help each other right to make places better and kind of communicate where is it lacking this kind of communication where where do we lose it and i think it's it's a, a again a decision making which needs to include a wide group of people yeah communication is a huge issue <laughs> now on various levels of bureaucracy uh in this time but, I, but don't you think it's partly sorry to just jump in but jump don't in. you think don't you think it's partly like by having events like this where we get people talking about what's possible and you know models of interesting better ways of doing things that you get more people pushing for those things to to happen as well so i think it's you know this is part of it this is actually a really healthy thing to get people dreaming and questioning um, how things work a broader audience than just the architects or historians or however yeah and how do we reach the real people who are in the front line? That's also the thing, who are dealing with these problems while we are talking. So that's like, you know, seeing how they are managing the space and dealing with it uh, with difficulties. And um, that's also the other level. I agree. We have so many questions that have poured in, but it's 8.30 and so we're, oh. supposed be, <laughs> we're supposed to be wrapping up right now. So unless we have time to maybe take one more question, I don't know if that's, maybe we could choose just one more to take and then we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, Malini, go, go ahead. Why don't you do that? One more question and kind of wrap it up. That would be great. And okay. we'll save the chat. So that'll be posted as well. So people can think about those questions as well when they watch the, the recording. Okay, thank you, Anne. So I'm gonna choose one of these. Um, I think, okay, I'll choose this one. So what responsibility do architects bear with regard to ugly and practical design? <laughs> we know who designed beautiful structures in spaces. However, we do not know who is responsible for ugly monstrosities. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the question. I don't know who would like to answer that. Um, I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to answer the one in the side that said that um, uh, you guys would answer whichever one, but um, the one about the mess, I, you know, the messy spaces and the, and the kind of creativity and the, and I know that's like a huge fear of, of people uh, that, you know, we, we want to make sure our environment doesn't look you know messy and so I know you know the, the one thing about um uh like when you have the right people in place and there may be a mess in the space that you're working but at the same time there is the balance that um Gould talked about where you have to keep that you know balance of of what's your little human intera interaction but but then also there's teachings of, you know, respect about how you, everything from like how you protect yourself and, and how you decorate yourself and how you decorate the land and how you decorate the space around you. And um, I think that, uh, I think 
that 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 would be yeah that's a, that's that's something that I totally you know working at a national gallery where everything is kind of like in in its place um, and then having this mess out out front was a huge leap they had never done anything like that before you know so um, I, I love seeing that it makes me feel happy <laughs> and at 42 my moments of happiness are hopefully coming back to you know um lots of happiness this year has been tough you know just like other people have talked about um but yeah we're really missing those spaces so and if they're messy that's okay because there's more important things um and also the last thing I will say and this is going to freak people out don't be afraid to take things down um I understand the connection of built heritage and you know and it's a scary thing to take away a building uh, or, or whatever it is but we don't always need to have them so <laughs> yeah and decorate everything that comes to you in your life and that includes buildings that's great i like this answer the question you want <laughs> this is good no it's great uh, susan would you like to well you're also mentioned in this question actually in the in the messy one the messy one yes yeah i wanted to jump in on that too because i was i was very excited that jamie wanted to talk to that one because i agree that's a that's a good one and um and I, I always remember when I when I lived in Berlin, vacant lots were never vacant because they always came up with things to do with them. And one of the, my favorite things was a kind of um, public um, lumber yard for teenagers that they would just occupy and start making tree houses and um, teenage playgrounds, basically. Um, and you, they were in a number of neighborhoods that you would just see this kind of space and they would always be very messy but then within the messiness you could tell that there were these kind of nest like spaces and it was in a very urban context and so to me it showed the kind of potential if you allow people in an urban context that they're going to to explore things like that and um, you know it could be that you'd see there's an old sink and there's things planted in it and then there's a ladder going up and oh there's a tree actually but they've almost hidden the tree with this structure and I just, I loved that kind of improvised, um, almost more like you're, yeah, like you're building a nest sort of experience. And I think that it teaches kids to, to think about how they can take existing things and, and make use of them and have fun and build. And I think more people who feel uh, enabled to build is probably good, it's healthy. Google, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, um, I just want to also think through it uh, in relation to the idea of learning by making, because we often associate architecture with something that we look at, right? An end result, polished result, like any art form. But we forget that for the makers, often the process is significant that it is the perfection of the self, it's the growth that matters. So this process of making, where I think this mess is happening, so-called mess at work, is ignored. Even in the case of, let's say, we talk about buildings, we look at the end result and we try to kind of talk about it in a way that what happens after. But this whole process is also is very telling and a learning experience. So I just wanted to add that. Peter, would you like to weigh in? Uh, actually, I, I'm going to uh, take a chance and, and jump in with a, uh, a response to the ugly monstrosity question <laughs> and, and say that I think whenever you have a situation where you've got a building and there are people who say, oh, that's an ugly monstrosity. And then you always have another group of people saying, no, it's wonderful. You just don't understand. And, and an impasse is reached almost instantaneously. And one group is rude and abusive. The other group is condescending and abusive. And, and it just doesn't go anywhere at all. So the question, what responsibility do architects bear when that sort of thing happens? Well, I think when you reach that sort of impasse, architects bear the same responsibility as everyone else in the situation to be thoughtful and articulate the positions 
in a way that is respectful and to listen to opposing points of view and to reach some sort of understanding. So, so in that sense, I don't think architects bear any more or any less responsibility than everyone else who has an opinion on architecture. Thank you, Peter. That was a great, great response to that, to that question. Um, <laughs> So thank you very much to all our panelists for this really wonderful talk. Um, lots to leave us with. Um, Jamie's words, don't be afraid to take things down, I think is really, really, really great. And learning by making, I think is really significant too. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. I wish we had more time. There's so many great questions here, um, but yeah, we'll save the chat. And so that's good. So uh, yes, everyone join me in thanking our panelists and yeah, good night. <laughs> Thank you, good night. Thank you so much. Thanks for all the people who've attended. Yes, good night everyone. Good night.